Look who's on! <laughs> Gotta have a party, I beg. Well, we're not. I've never heard of we're such not a thing. having a party because because I'm surprising Deborah. I'm taking her to Bear Mountain. Bear yeah, Mountain. To me, the most memorable thing about after the pilot was screened was people in the hallway were repeating lines from the pilot, which doesn't happen very often. I think I'm having sex. <laughs> People were walking around the hallway saying, you know, Bear Mountain. <laughs> and uh, to me, that was a very good sign that, that there was a lot of support for the pilot within the company. The pilot was, you know, one of the funniest things I've ever seen. You know that the fruit keeps coming oh. month after month? <laughs> He's got us in some kind of a cult. It's not a cult, Ma, it's a club. The Fruit of the Month Club, to me, remains one of the funniest scenes in the history of television. It's just a very classically funny sitcom scene, which I think that scene propelled the show, sold the show. We shoot it, we, we, we were happy with it. Yeah. And then it's just, I heard, I remember waiting to hear if it gets picked up, and that happens at the upfronts, right? Right. Which is in May where they announce their fall schedule. We do about 20 pilots a year. Going in, it wasn't a high priority. It was like, okay, there's this guy Ray Romano and Phil, and it was for Letterman's company. And at the same time, we were introducing the Cosby Show, the new Cosby Show. So that was the big ticket item, you know. So we looked at the pilot. Um, we looked at the rough cut. And I remember we liked it right away. Um, our network at that point was struggling. We were, we were in very bad shape. CBS in 1996 was in last place. Um, so we stuck it on on Friday night. I remember getting the call that the show got picked up. For, for the fall. For and uh, my agent said, congratulations, you're picked up. And I was like, great. And they said, they want to know who's going to run the show. And I said, oh, I assumed me. And they said, why should, why should they trust you to run a show? You never ran a show before. I said, yeah, but you, you, we did the pilot. You like the pilot? Yeah, we'll do more like that. When you're at a network and you're betting millions of dollars on somebody's ability to produce a show week in and week out, there's always a lot of uh, trepidation when it's somebody who hasn't done it before. I totally understood where they were coming from. However, where I was coming right. from, the show was so personal to Ray and me that I couldn't see anyone else. Like, I wasn't going to work for someone else on my show. It doesn't make sense, you know? So I couldn't live with that. I said, uh, uh, I quit. Yeah, I, I just, I had to, I had to just make a choice. I couldn't live that way. And they, for some reason, they changed their mind and, and let me run the show. Well, I never told you this, but I made a phone call and I said, listen, if he quits, I'm going to be mad. I'm not going to quit. <laughs> but I'll be mad. And they didn't want me mad. I remember Ray being very anxious about the title, as Ray is about many things. Ray is, he's a tortured guy, constantly tortured between wanting to be popular and being liked by the audience, but hating himself and thinking they must hate me. So for him to have the title, Everybody Loves Raymond, was he just hated it with such a passion. I ended up coining that phrase, my character in the pilot, uh, where I went, everybody loves Raymond, and, and which is something that Ray's brother really said to him in real life. Oh, Robbie. Everybody loves Raymond. The spirit in which it's intended is this kind of sarcastic, yeah. jealous, very specific Tongue and cheek character kind of, yeah. thing that the brother has, and we like that it came from that. But unless you watch the show once and hear it yeah you may not know that so everything we did was would, was to try to work against the sound of that well title. what happened was uh you know the story of him saying it phil you just put it as a working title when when he was working on this just my wife read title. The, my wife read yeah. the script where he says that and she said that should be the name of the show the moment of drama for me was when i had to call him up and plead to him not to Title the show, Everybody Loves Raymond. This isn't Ray Romano, superstar. This is Ray, who's doing stand-up, who might be on a TV show, saying to the president of CBS, please, can you change it? It sounded strange, and then we sort of grew to like it a lot. So we're putting it on the air, and Ray calls up, and he hated the title. He was embarrassed. 
He said, I don't want the show to have my name in it. You know, it's terrible. It puts too much pressure on me. Les said, we like the title. It tested well, whatever that means. You know, they bring it to a room full of people who were waiting at a bus stop. And they, and they asked him if they liked the title. <laughs> he said, you're welcome to come up with other titles and we'll yes, test those. Yes, he said, we'll test other titles. You, so, you got to do it fast. I still have this scribbled piece of paper framed hanging in my dressing room. And it has, you know, whatever the best I could come up with. But like that Raymond guy, here's Raymond. Everybody could take or leave Raymond. <laughs> yeah. My favorite, and this was, I was, I was dead serious about this. Um, Raymond. U-M comma Raymond. You're like a genius with titles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why they... Yeah. Picked everybody loves Raymond. But so so he tried all these. Lucky Raymond, I remember. Raymond's tree. Raymond's tree, because I thought like the family tree. Everybody loves Raymond. What, you, know, you know, you know, what is this puppets? I mean, we really didn't really know. And after you meet Ray, then you know it's it, it's really a bad title. You know, I wanted to call it. Uh, Why is Ray doing that? Uh, how did this guy get a show Monday nights at nine? I remember at one point calling Letterman and pleading to him. Is there anything you can do? And, and he, he said, basically Who said, this? Who is this? He, he said, Ray, how did you get my number? <laughs> uh, he basically said, you know, I think the show will take on a life of its own and the title won't mean anything. And, you know, I, I guess for the He's most smart. part it's true. But, yeah. So I sort of lied to him. I said, look, let's just get on the air with it. If it's successful, then we can change it. Then once it was successful, I said, well, it's successful. We can't change it, you know. Um, so so I, I, I sort of duped him a little bit, I must admit. But, uh, you know, I still love the title. It was different. It didn't sound like every other sitcom name. It was unusual, and uh, it sort of stuck. Now, not every family would go by on a conveyor belt for you, but mine would because... Everybody loves Raymond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We weren't out to break the form. We were trying to do a traditional, well-made, classic type of sitcom, you know? Because we felt that when we started, that alone would make it stand out because there weren't very many shows like it. Oh, you still want the talking. Look, this is better than talking. This is writing. Uh-huh. Phil, he always quotes Carl Reiner in saying that when Carl Reiner was doing the Dick Van Dyke show, when he was writing his stories, he would get his writers together in a room and he would say, Okay, what happened to you this weekend? So I always remembered that, and I, I thought for this kind of show, you want to run it the same way. When getting stories from our own lives, you start to examine everything that happens in your life, and you, you, you find yourself, when you're, you're arguing with your wife, you kind of drift away and think, oh, this would be good, I'm going to keep this fight going a little bit longer, because I think, I've got, I, think I, I have enough for one act, and I need to say something horrible to her to, to get that second act going. We're taking a big gamble, basing a whole show on a guy who never acted before. So we're very lucky that he can act. At the beginning, he was so nervous about appearing phony in any way <laughs> that he would only do things that really... That I would do. ...happened to him <laughs> or... <laughs> like were it, organic. Exactly. See, he's yeah. even talking like an actor. Yeah, yeah. Like drink coffee, wouldn't drink coffee in the scene yeah. because Raymond doesn't drink coffee in real life. He had to broaden himself a little, because I remember in a script we wrote, it, was, it said, Ray gets a cup of coffee. And he, oh, wait, I don't drink coffee. Some people call it crazy. I'm going to say this is a method actor. But, I, you know, I tried to trick him and say, maybe uh, in the cup doesn't have to be coffee, you know? And you can just pretend. That. Nah, it was a, kind of a stretch. And finally, I remember he said, uh, when we, because we needed this coffee bit, because yeah. we had nothing else. Uh, he said, I guess at some point I have to start acting. <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I have favorite episodes, and of course, they're usually the ones I'm not in. But I don't remember a lot from season one. I, I, I really don't. All I know is I kept getting dressed in the bathroom. Hey. <laughs> Shower's broken. My first script, which was this, the IQ script called Standard Deviation, I think it was the first time that Robert was used prominently, especially in relation to uh, in, in scenes alone with Ray. Who invented the cotton gin? Oh, that's easy. Eli Wallach. <laughs> Whitney. Whitney. <laughs> I, you know what I meant? I meant Whitney, Robert. And we saw their chemistry for the first time, I think, in that script. And there's a scene where Robert's giving Ray an IQ test, and there's something with blocks. and. Ray's not finished with the blocks, and they both have their hands in the blocks, and, and Robert slowly takes the block back from Ray. <laughs> no. 
it wasn't something that was written in the script. And we could see that Brad could really hold his own with Ray, and this was going to be uh, a good uh, a good relationship. I'm a buffoon with pathos. And uh, as Ray said, I should probably get an ointment. Brad, you could always depend on, I don't know whether his, his voice, his presence, his delivery, he could always uh, deliver that last line to get you to laugh to get you out of the scene. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. So, so I'm not smarter than her. I'd be very surprised. I like to write for all the characters. I like to write different characters for different reasons. I like Deborah a lot because, uh, I mean, Patty's great, but I'm also writing uh, my wife through her. Now it's a happy marriage. <laughs> She really has been able to come into her own and be a fully fleshed out three-dimensional person who still has to be that voice of reason. She's still the outsider in the family. The first season while I was watching the show was more about, I think I watched Deborah a lot to see, you know, I guess because I thought she was me for a while, you know, <laughs> also like everyone else thought. I say, what is she going to do? What is she, you know, is she going to be? And like, am I really like that? I love you. I'm watching Ray also kiss another woman. That's, you know, kind of a, a new thing. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, that they had to do that in the pilot, like, a lot. There was a lot of kissing yeah. in the pilot. I thought this only happened on my birthday. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a little bit strange and maybe slightly uncomfortable to meet the actual spouse of uh, someone you're acting with, who, who you know, who you have to be kissing and uh, laying in bed with in your pajamas. Okay, Diamond Jim, take it off. <laughs> <laughs> I almost feel it's my job to reassure her that, you know, I won't get pregnant. Uh <laughs> wow. Isn't that better than basketball? <laughs> you know, I think I sweat about the same. If I had a show, I wouldn't be that interesting to write for. I'm not as quirky and neurotic as Ray is. You know, I still, uh, I don't like looking at myself. Phil will tell you, when we watch the playback and when we're editing, Yes, what's it's my what's my uh, <laughs> you usually give yourself the finger. I like giving myself the finger yeah. when I watch myself. Our Christmas episode, uh, Phil really wanted Ray, Ray's character to kiss his his father's character. Just on the forehead, not on the lips, but <laughs> Merry Christmas, Dad, you know, sweet scene. And He's coming after like an argument. With after him. a big argument. Yeah, do me a favor. Don't come over and make up stories to Allie, OK? Come on, I'm, I'm a grandfather, that's what I do. I tell stories. It's in the manual. We had a huge discussion about this because Raymond, this wouldn't happen. Because Ray's not a big kisser. He's not a kisser and, or a hugger. And so, especially with his parents. So we all make him kiss and hug us. Yeah. <laughs> so just to watch we his force face him. contort. <laughs> he was adamant that this would not, well, that, that, that the character wouldn't do it, even though the character yes. was, you know, yeah. And, and he wasn't going to kiss him, and Phil stopped pressing. Phil said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't kiss him. If in the moment on Friday night when we're shooting in front of the audience, you get to that part and you feel it, you do it. If not, I'm not asking you to do it. And he did it. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. I mean, because, especially because it came from a guy who doesn't normally do it. So it means more. It's one thing to, to get something on paper, but when, when you, the way these people can bring it to life and, the, and what they bring to it, who they are, that, you know, as, as a great actor, you know, once told me, he says, you know, when an actor is up there doing what they're doing, what you're seeing is the sum total of their life. And sometimes, you know, when I see this cast operating, the, 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 Peter and Doris and, and, and Brad and, and Patty, I, you know, I go, look at this, look at the richness, look what they bring. Have you been drinking again? <laughs> when we started out, we were on Friday nights. 
you know, and, uh, you know, we were, we were getting killed by shows like, you know, Jerry the Lizard. The last time CBS was successful on a Friday night was Gomer Pyle. It's depressing because you, you think we're doing great work, people should watch. On the other hand, it's like, you know what? Let's just write the show to the best of our abilities. We're laughing. And I thought, well, I love what I'm doing. I love my character. I think the writing is superb. And uh, all of it works so well. But if no one's watching us, we're in trouble. We were up against the TGIF uh, block that they had uh, with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. and Your own kids. Yeah, my own, even in my house, yeah. I got a zero rating. We were like number 83, and you know, Ray was like, I told you it's over. You know, he's so positive and just builds you up when, uh, you know, when the, just run towards the flames, it's easier, you know. But because the critics loved it and Les loved it, he decided he would give us one shot for a few weeks at a Monday night time slot. I believe it was after Cosby. And if we didn't do it, if we didn't make better numbers, we were going to have to go, no matter how much Les loved the show. Les Moonves at CBS told us early on, he said, I believe in the show. We're going to find a home for it. Now, last time a studio exec told me that, uh, I was living in a van. The first night we did well, and then towards the like fourth or fifth or sixth week, we started to increase his numbers. So we felt a little better. Not too good, but... You never <laughs> want to feel too good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's his motto. I remember we were at El Cholo on Western Avenue, a Mexican restaurant, and, uh, and our line producer at the time went and called in for the ratings. And it, the, the test was to see whether we went up from Bill Cosby. The Cosby show was on ahead of us. And if we went up from Cosby, that was sort of like, that was it. We were guaranteed a second season. It was a great moment to know that we'd get a shot to, uh, you know, tell another 24 stories or something. I'm all alone. Where do I go? Wait a minute, what happened to me? You passed away. <laughs> what? I died? How did I die? We'll see. Raymond was extremely significant because it was really our first flag in the ground, like, okay, this is going to be very representative of where we're going and what we're doing. And it was, it was the little train that could. Your volumizer? Your volumizer, it makes my hair louder. <laughs> Most new television shows don't succeed, and also I develop, you know, 60 projects a year. Only, you know, 10 of those even get to the pilot stage, and from there, you know, very few become successful hit television shows. It's extraordinary. I've been doing this for 50 years. Um, it's the best gig I've ever known. Peanut, almond, cashew. Peanut, <laughs> almond, cashew. I think that everyone around here, even all these years later, we're grateful, you know? It hasn't gone to our head. Though I, I do have to be honest with you, I have bought a lot of Fabergé eggs. Hold this for me, darling. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience that I, I, that I knew all the way through, from the very first, from the moment that I read that pilot. I went, oh boy, look at this. We had no big stars, we had no sex appeal and we just lived on the fact that we were a funny show and we were funny in a very relatable way. I think it'll be remembered as, as, as maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe the last great sitcom. What's the difference between a bunion and a corn? You know, it really was a sleeper and you love that. You love it when nobody's known, you know, just think where Ray Romano is today and where he was then, you know? He was a stand-up comedian nobody had ever heard of, and now he's a, he's a household name. Wake up! There's pudding everywhere. But I think it's interesting for people who are watching this DVD, this first season, I think, I hope, that you see the show started well, and if you watch that first episode to just the last episode from the DVD, you see some growth there, and then you see, knowing the show as it exists now, where we went. No, no Parmesan, no Parmesan. <laughs> Nothing starts at the place it's going to get to. And hopefully we went like this. That was the goal. How does this feel? Point. Oh, Frank. Point. Give daddy some sugar. <laughs> I'm a free man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, there you go.